Hello, everyone. Welcome to 360 Degrees Excellence, where we believe everyone can achieve all-round success. Today, I'm going to be having a conversation with Dr. Uh, Joshua O. Adegoke. And today, we're going to be talking about the relevance of social gospel. Uh, not too long ago, I shared on my social media platform about uh, Charles Children's book, titled In the Steps, What Will Christ Do? The book written by Charles gave rise to the social media, social gospel uh, movement in the US. And what is social gospel all about? It's about walking in Jesus' steps. It's about being like Jesus and trying to emulate him and trying to reach out to the less privileged trying to reach out to the poor or any needy person, to the vulnerable group. That is what social gospel is all about. That is not only about just telling people about Jesus and we must also understand that when Jesus was on hand, he was very, very interested in the poor. I remember the story of uh, a particular person. I think it was people that were complaining that uh, I think an, an alabaster hall, a very uh, expensive ointment was used to but to buy something for Jesus. And they were saying that thing could, be, could have been used to buy something for the poor. And Jesus said, the poor you always have in your midst. So Jesus is really interested in reaching out to the poor. So, and I'm glad to be speaking to someone that is serious about social uh, gospel. He also has an initiative that is into that. We're gonna be talking about that. So without wasting time, let's dig in. So I'm gonna be asking my guest, Dr. Adequate. So just first tell us about himself. Doctor, I would just like to know more about you. I would like, I know a lot about you, but I would like my viewers to know more about you, where you were born, uh, what do you do, and everything you like to share with uh, the viewers. Over to you, Doc. Oh, thank you, Prof. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to, I mean, giving me this platform uh, to be able to share my views, my opinion, on who I am, what I'm doing, and what we could do together. Uh, really grateful for this opportunity. Uh, my name is uh, Joshua Adegoke. Um, I was born in, the, in a small town uh, called Okitipupwa in Ondo State, uh, Nigeria. Uh, I was born into a family of my parents were Christians until a particular time in their, in their life that they moved away from Christ. But I was born during the time that they were uh, Christians in gospel faith mission. So I was born into gospel faith mission. I was bo born into evangelical and uh, I've been doing that maybe maybe one, one, one two, not two years of away from uh, the faith, I came back um, I went to school, primary school at uh, Octopa St. Mary's uh, uh, RCM. Uh, after that, I went to another community uh, secondary school called Ofe Dekpe Comprehensive High School. And it's from this uh, little background, that small background, and of course, the poor background that I was able to sit for my uh, wife after about two, two, uh, two attempts. I uh, did my jam and I got uh, admission into Futa. And as a matter of fact, I am not the first child, but somehow I, the first, uh, I'm one of the, we we'll call it a first generation uh, graduates in my family. I'm the first to get a wife result. Uh, and the first to get admission to study uh, mechanical engineering at Fedra University of uh, Technology at Kure. Um, it was a landmark as far as my family is concerned uh, because nobody else has done it before because of the kind of environment where we grew up from. Um, majorly the fact that I had a lot of friends who were really determined to go to school around that time. The time we finished from secondary school was the time a lot of 
uh, guys in town were ready good to go to university. And so we studied together. Some, sometimes there are no books to read, but we still went through all the process uh, to get admission to the various universities. And also I got into FUTA at that time. Now I got into FUTA, I rededicated my life in 1992 uh, at Full Gospel Businessman Fellowship. Uh, no, it was through the Ministry of uh, Bishop Wale Oke. He came to town to October in 1992 for uh, Evangelical Crusade. And I rededicated my life at that time. And from there, I joined the uh, uh, Full Gospel Businessman Fellowship. And uh, that's where I was exposed to the, the Pentecostal life, even though I was born into evangelical, um, speaking in tongues, being filled with the Holy Spirit, gifts of the Spirit, and, and so on and so forth. And I was, uh, fortunately, I got in touch with a mentor, uh, Pastor Ayo Loto, and his family who took me in and I was exposed to the word of faith. I uh, grew up teach, I mean, reading uh, W. Kenyon, uh, Kennedy again, in, as far as back as 1992, devote all those stuffs before I went into university. So I went to university with um, a good background of my Christian faith, uh, ready to explode. And when I got to, into FUTA, FUTA was, uh, I got into um, CCF, NIFERS, uh, which is like an evangelical uh, movement too. So I, I fit in properly uh, into that uh, circle. And I was part of everything going for evangelism. And uh, maybe after a year of being in FUTA, I was, uh, I got into the central school, which we call the, like their pastors were, were ordained as pastors and leading about uh, 300 to 400 uh, uh, students, um, teaching, preaching, going everywhere, going to villages. And so FUTA was like, a home to me because uh, of my background, Futa gave me uh, their hands, CCF, they gave me their hands and we became a family to the extent that I don't even during the holidays, of course, usually you don't have a home to go to in, in terms that uh, if you go home with, uh, if it costs you about 200 Naira to go, home, by the time you get home, you might get uh, uh, 100 Naira. So it means going home is like, doesn't really worth it because uh, you might not be able to come back. Uh, but I'm so grateful to God for brethren in uh, Futa, the CCF. We needed food. The food was available physically, spiritually, mentally. Uh, so I was like living on, uh, on what is coming from the fellowship because the fellowship has that structure to support uh, poor uh, kids, because I am thinking, I'm of the opinion that if it was not available, some of us would have dropped out, out of university because of hunger and uh, things like that. And it was, re it was really uh, bad to the extent sometimes that uh, you want to eat, but there's no food to eat, but you always see friends who can come to your rescue. Uh, some of our sisters were wonderful, so they will get food available to you. That's why I love, I always appreciate people who go to, um, I mean, you ended up in, in a school, there's a little bit diversity in terms of reach the poor. So the rich uh, sisters and brothers helped the poor to be able to finish school. And the father was able to graduate in Futa, thanks to God and thanks to brethren who made it possible for me. Thank I you so much. From Futa yeah. in 2000. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so thank, from there, thank, proceeded thank. Uh, looking for a job for a long a number of years until yeah. I got a job as a teach as a lecturer, and from there I could got I got a scholarship to study abroad, and from there got married very early to my beautiful wife. I have three kids, and now we're based in Birmingham, uh, United Kingdom, where I'm working as a an engineering lecturer. Uh, so for so I've been teaching for a year for years now for about uh, 15 years of teaching that that's my passion I love teaching and apart from that I love uh, forming collaboration to change the story of 
sub-Saharan, generally talking about Nigeria as a point of contact. So that's what basically what I'm doing. And that's what this represents. I'm in the yeah. UK because of UK. I'm in the UK because of Nigeria. So every opportunity that will benefit Nigeria, uh, I will take advantage of it to reduce poverty. And the last part of my life is, uh, I mean, the other part of my life, which is very important, is using the, to improve, uh, working to improve quality, quality of education in rural communities in Nigeria. Uh, knowing the, my background, that if I had not had very good, quali uh, uh, cheap, free, but quality education, I might not be able to achieve what I've achieved today. So I'm feeling that other uh, guys who are presently in my shoe should get uh, a platform to be able to uh, get a quality education so that they might reach the, the zenith of their life and their, their full potential in life. And I know it's possible uh, through quality education. Um, Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, awesome, awesome. I, li I like your response. I like your response. We're also going to talk about, you know, your story, some of the things you do, you know, and I remember when I was looking at your bow, I also realized that um, you are also interested in food security. And I, and I didn't know that about you. I remember that um, we met at um, Biari, and uh, we're going to talk about that off camera. I, I want to ask you, your proposal, the proposal you submitted for Biari, yeah. uh, you know, in those days, yeah, we're going to talk about it off, yeah. off camera. But, but, but is he in line with agriculture or something like that? Uh, no, uh, that was on uh, in uh, energy. Uh, okay, so sustainable energy. energy. Okay, sustainable energy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Which is okay, sustainable. part of what I do now, sustainable energy. Okay, sustainable energy. Uh, okay, okay. Um, okay. sustainable energy. Something that has okay, energy. okay. Okay, okay. For, is it about clean energy, renewable energy, exactly, something like exactly. that? Okay, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. We need that in Africa, and we have a lot of it. Yeah, we have that's true. solar. Uh, everything can be exported, like what Morocco is planning to do. You know, yeah. very, 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 very interesting. Now we're talking about social gospel. You know, and it's all about being like Christ, walking in the steps, uh, follow Him, and something like that. And I came across a quote uh, by. Mahatma Gandhi, and this popular leader uh, in India, you know, or that's passed on now. And he says something, I like your Christ. I don't like your Christians. Your Christians are just unlike Christ. Do, do you agree with him? Is he right or he, was he right or was he wrong? <laughs> oh, thank you, Prof. Um, we, there's no evidence uh, to show that Gandhi really said that, yeah, uh, accredited to him. Another person, an Indian philosopher named Bharat Dada, was okay. assumed to have said that. Okay. Um, so, but there's no error. But that's the point that people are not sure exactly whether it was Gandhi that said it or yeah. not. But that, uh, uh, that's let's maybe we should focus, like you rightly said, on the on the quote rather than the author. Um, yeah. I want to assume what the person is trying to say. Uh, there are two aspects of Christ, uh, two aspects of Christianity that uh, one has to do with accepting the sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary for mankind, that he came to save mankind from their sins. Now, after you've done that, you start doing the works, not works before salvation. Salvation through Christ, after then, you start showing the good works. And I expect that, as in the good works are the things seen by men. He said, let your light so shine among men that they might see your good works. So let's assume Gandhi said it. Gandhi was, I assume he was looking for the good works, which yeah. I appreciate. But it doesn't mean that Gandhi agrees with Christ, saying that I like Christ. He doesn't understand, he, he, he never understood Christ. He was looking for the signs. Mm. Because if you say you like somebody, that means you must accept that he is God who was and he 
an age to come. He must accept Christ not as just a teacher or a moralist or a good man. I would have expected him, if you had understood that, to accept Christ as God's incarnate to save mankind. So he didn't appreciate the facts, the other aspect of Christ, but he was looking for the sense, which is good for anybody who is outside Christ uh, to start looking for that. But I want to say that he saw Christ, he read something about Christ, he wrote about the teachings of Christ, which was speaking to social justice. Uh, but I would have, as, as a Christian, I would have appreciated the fact if he had accepted Christ as God's substitute for our sins, probably. Maybe he did that before he passed away or not, but it's not enough, it's not sufficient to accept him as a good man, as a great teacher, as a great prophet. It does, you, it does no one any good. You must accept him first as somebody who came to die for the sins of mankind. Now the other aspect, you start living it or you start seeing it, amen. So if you see a Christian who is not living like Christ in terms of his uh, moral life, that is not, uh, it's, it's something that should be of concern to you. But that does not mean he has not encountered Christ. We are looking for the fruits. That's true. We must see the fruit. But this person must have a, might have a root in Christ, which guarantees him, guarantees the fact that his sins have been forgiven. So we're expecting them to not start showing the good works. Uh, that's what yeah. I'll say about that. Th thank you so much. You also mentioned, I'm not sure whether you talked about it. You know, Christ is the Savior and Christ is the Lord. It's one thing for you to accept Christ as your savior. Yeah. Another thing for you to accept Christ as your Lord. Because mm -hmm. if someone is your Lord, whatever he tells you to do, you will do it. Exactly. And there was a time Jesus said something. He said, anyone that wants to follow me must be ready to deny himself and take up the cross. But mm -hmm. recently I was just thinking that following Jesus is hard. And I'm, and I'm beginning to realize that it's a God's grace. And I'm yeah. sure maybe that's why a lot of people... Uh, they would say, okay, ah, I can't do this. This thing is too hard, you know? And, and that's the truth. And I, I'm also thinking that it's, it's also important for uh, as teachers of the word of God, yeah. as pastors, yeah. to let people know that following Christ is not a joke. Yeah. Following Christ involves you, you know, becoming selfless. Yeah, exactly. Not yourself, exactly. which is hard. Human being generally is selfish. He's always thinking about himself. And I think that, 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 that should be emphasized. What do you think about that? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I think it has a lot to do with the Christianity as defined now. Now, yeah. when we were growing up in the 70s, 70s, early 80s, which, uh, we grew up with this SU movement, even in our secondary school. Yeah. The only Christ we knew was the one who made a sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. And as a disciple of Christ, to be a disciple, you must also make that sacrifice. So the teachings those days were different. I mean, are di I mean different from what we are having now. So if Christ is, the, the, maybe for you, for me, the Christ that was presented to me was a Christ who died for mankind, laid his life, a Christ, the Christ who will always forgive, a Christ who will always love, a Christ who will not who will be slapped on one side and who will not uh, retaliate. A Christ that will always uh, uh, that will not retaliate when it's that's the kind of Christianity we were shown. That's what we knew, and you can see that those days you will see a lot of Christians. I was told I don't know whether it's true that when um, they were about to start uh, West African uh, Examination Council, I don't know whether it's true that they went to SU people to look for people there because they are sure that they will get the right kind of person to, to be able to, um, people of integrity, people that have character. I don't know whether we can have such today. So the teachings in the 80s, 70s, 80s emphasized Christian sacrifice, carrying your cross and follow him. But now at this, a lot of people who gave their life in the late 2000, in some other, uh, I mean, specifically in some areas, what, the only thing they knew about the Christ who will give them food, the, I mean, the Christ who will make them rich. So they might not have had the other side 
of Christianity, which has to do with uh, personal sacrifice, a lot of sacrifice, discipline, uh, self-control, they might not have had that. So they might not have seen Christ in the, in the, in the, read, uh, in the read sense of where, how it should be presented, like the disciples did. The disciples yeah. of Jesus Christ uh, never went, I mean, never had this kind of gospel that we had. They had the right gospel. They saw Christ. They lived a life. They went, they, a lot of epistles that were written was re, were written from prisons. Mm, These guys yeah. suffered. They, they, the Bible even said that the, this word never, mm. it, it, didn't, it didn't deserve them. That's how, mm. what they went through in fasting, in, in a lot of things. They went through a lot to become, to, for the Christianity to get across to us. But now, it's, I, sometimes in some places, it looks like uh, bread and butter. So I can't blame this generation. It's what is presented to them. So the responsibility to present the right gospel, it's, it's with the teachers, the pastors, because that's what the Bible said, it gave gifts unto men mm, yeah. for, for a purpose, not to make people rich. No, not financially rich, not even to heal people. It comes with it, but that's not the focus. The focus is not healing. The focus is not, the focus is about to be like Christ. For us, for me, everybody, to see Christ is that looking onto, onto him, the author and the finisher of our faith. So look at what he, he said, like I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Mm. That's the Christ mm. that was given to us. That's why the Christ we need to emphasize to our, mm. so that people would not get disappointed if they don't see what um, they were told when yeah. they came into uh, mm -hmm. uh, Christianity. Yeah, and I think it's true. And one thing about Christ is this, Christ is plain. Christ will not tell you. He told us, he said, you are going to have tribulation. Exactly. You know, he didn't tell the disciples fake news. He didn't tell them, look, guys, it's going to be easy for you. It's going to be rosy for you. He said, no, you guys, you are going to have a time. Yeah. But he said, be of good she have overcome the world. Exactly. You know, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about, once again, about social gospel today. Mm. Why do you think it should be promoted in Africa, where we are from? Uh, thank you again, uh, Prof. Um, maybe the problem people might have with the world social gospel is because the way it's like an ad, um, something added to the gospel. But I think the person, the, the, the movement that added the world social to it is they were trying to bring out something from the gospel. Uh, they were trying to emphasize something. Um, because social is in the gospel. Uh, these people start, uh, I was told it started in the, um, uh, the middle of 19th century where yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, they start, uh, the, these movements uh, start interpreting the, God, the kingdom of God as requiring social as well as individual salvation. So it's, uh, I think they met individual salvation on ground and saw that in the midst of industrialized society, people are suffering, people were living in slums. So they now said, oh, okay, this, if you look at the totality of the gospel, there is the place for the love, for love and the place for justice. So they started ministering to people, um, trying to minister, they were really focusing on the poor and getting them settled, getting them out of uh, asylum, I mean, slum and neighborhoods to help them, specifically the, the immigrants. So they settled them, gave them education, gave them culture and social help for the tenants. Uh, nurses were provided for them. That's how it all started. And as a matter of fact, you asking me whether we should have it in Africa. Prof, that's what we had. The gospel we had in, the go in, 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 uh, in Africa, the first, when the gospel came into Africa, it came with quality education. That's why we were able to go to school. It came with uh, building uh, hospitals. We yeah. had it, but we don't know what, exactly what happened. So that's, I think we should think about restoring it yeah. back so that the poor can feel this, uh, our, our gospel. The, the, the need for uh, salvation, individual salvation, which is good, because that's what we're always between this line. Some guys are focusing on justification, which is um, accepting the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross of Calvary. Uh, he took our sin and we took his righteousness. That's justification. 
but the uh, why some some people are emphasizing on that the evangelical and the other groups they have emphasized on justification. Another group now with this uh, the recent issue about uh, Black Lives Matters, they are focusing on justice. Yeah. Now we need to marry the two together in Africa, justification and justice, uh, because that's what Christ stood for. That's what the gospel is about. About Christ died. There is salvation for individual and there's freedom that you should speak the truth. Christ spoke, spoke against the Pharisees. Christ spoke against, he, he, he talked about um, the Samaritan person talking about the poor, somebody who was injured, you take care of the injured. He talked about uh, uh, a woman who went for justice. Uh, uh, to, she spoke to a, a, a judge and the guy couldn't be bothered about him. Uh, but she started speaking and speaking until the, the, the judge decided to, to. So Christ was speaking. He spoke about the prodigal son. That means no matter what you have gone through, no matter your mess, you can be cleaned up. That's an, an aspect of Christ that we need to bring into justice. We need to take care of the poor. We need to take care of the orphans. We need to take care of, of the widows. We cannot be a, a, a generation or a society that neglects the poor. We can never be a generation of Christians that neglect the, the widows. We can never be a generation. Now, I've heard this word many times in churches in Africa, that we are not a charity organization. When hmm. people are emphasizing the fact you need to help the poor. Huh. Hmm. But they are registered as charity. Yes, charity. So how come you're saying you emphasize building more than the people? Now, Maybe we, we missing it up. I always remember the Christianity started as a social movement in the fact that they preached the gospel, which is justification. People received the gospel. They went to sell their properties, brought yeah. the money to the feet of the apostles. That's the only thing we emphasize, bring it to the apostles' feet. What did they do with the money? They bought food. They bought everything. So there was no rich person. Nobody richer than the other, nobody poorer. They, make, they have a common purpose where they were distributing money, food to everybody. So we, they were at the same level. I yeah. think that's social uh, gospel indeed. Everybody was at the same level. Nobody, no reason to. So they were focusing uh, on the gospel, preaching the gospel from one place to the other because everybody has had food to eat. Everybody have everything they need. Were, were, I mean, was available through the contribution of everybody. As a matter of fact, the apostle didn't say they should give to God because that's the issue that we're facing now. A lot of people is packaging give to God. I'm not saying they're not giving to God, but the, the, uh, the apostle was, they were, all they are giving was giving to the people, 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 the poor among them, the, the, the widows among them, the immigrants among them. That's what they were using the money for. They were not giving to, because the Bible said that if you claim to love God that you don't see, and you don't love your <laughs> brother, you're just, you're just in darkness, you're, you're just lying. I have never seen God before. The only people I've seen is you. It's yeah. uh, uh, all other people. I can imagine, uh, Prof, sorry for making, uh, making reference to this. I remembered somebody contacted me online. The guy is from my town. He lives in South Africa. He said, he, I think he was doing his master's or his PhD. And he said, uh, he's, he's, he's an orphan. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I remember now. And he said, he's stranded. Yeah, he, cannot con he couldn't continue his education. He needed money, and blah, blah, like that. I just called you. Hmm. I told you. And the, I didn't, do, that was the, I just said it, and that was it. Because I knew how we grew up, where we grew up from. Yeah. I'm talking about Futa now. Yeah. I sorted the guy. The guy came back to me that I should that he was he was shocked that somebody oh, who has never met him could do that. And I know that I was not disappointed because I know that's the kind of gospel we should be preaching. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm I'm so excited about all what you said that it started well. Uh, you know, you were mentioning how they brought the gospel to Africa, the Catholics, the Anglicans how they started. I can still remember, uh, you know, going to St. Louis or speak to in Owo because uh, my parents are really from Owo, you know, going there and how the Catholic did that. And I, I think 
what is important is for us to go back and it's possible for us to do that, for us to go there. And I, you also have an organization called Extra uh, Community Helper Initiative. And mm -hmm. I'm excited about what you guys have done. You know, it's amazing. Can you tell us about Extra uh, Initiative? Um, thanks, uh, Prof, again. Um, Extra Community Helpers Initiative is an, an NGO um, a charity, like we call, like call it over here in the UK, uh, that started um, about four years ago. I had my birthday and I thought that instead of doing a party, I could provide uniform for, for kids in these uh, communities. Now, except you are in this community, you might not, uh, no one might be able to understand Turn exactly what is happening in this age. But I think data around will tell us that about 15 to 13, I mean 13 to 15 million um, kids could, uh, uh, outside, they couldn't get access to um, education. That's out, outside the school environment. They can't, they are not in. Now, um, I, I just thought about people that are in also, the kids that are in in these marginalized communities. I grew up in, uh, in, a, in a situation whereby uh, school uniform was an issue. I'm talking about uh, 30, 35 years ago. Uh, I'm so surprised that, I mean, we had a situation whereby we were driven out of school because of 20 naira school fees. Many times we miss school sessions because of it. We have to patch our school uniform, I'm not, I'm not talking about uh, wearing sandals. That's not part of the thing we are thinking about. U school uniform, it was difficult to get the white on top of uh, yellow like we had in our school. And I know a couple of my friends who could not finish secondary school because they couldn't pay their school fees. I'm talking about 20 naira at that time. The parents could not afford it. And they, they, couldn't, get, uh, they couldn't get to the level I am today. Many of them just went into trading um, things like that. Some of them up to today, they're still struggling because they never had that. I was even out, we'll be beaten, we'll be flogged, or we'll asked to go home, come back the next day, there's no money and things like that. So I was expecting by now, this thing shouldn't be. I thought things would have improved. But unfortunately, my, my survey shows that uh, there are a lot of students, a lot of puppies in primary school and secondary school in these marginalized uh, communities uh, rural communities that are still going through what I went through 40, I mean, 35 to 40 years ago. So I came up with this concept uh, to start giving them uniform. I started with 30,000 Naira. That's about, that's less than uh, uh, $30 or 30 pounds. And I spoke with some of my friends that, uh, can we provide uniform for kids? In, and they responded, a lot of my friends responded. And um, I said, oh, okay, I could take it further. Why not adopt a school and start giving them stuff? So we, we started with, uh, I spoke with my church, uh, Living, State, uh, Living Stones uh, in Birmingham there. Yeah. I spoke with another um, uh, friend who owns a uh, environmental company. We we'll call it Daunting Environmentals and Living Stones. They were, as soon as I told them that this is my vision, this is what we want to do. They, they grab with all their hands. And since for the past four years, they have been supplying 90 to 95% of everything we need. Now, what are the things that we have done? Uh, like in, in, a, in a, one of the primary schools that we adopted, St. Mary's RCM, Okitubupa, which is the school I finished from. Uh, we, um, we did perimeter fencing of their school around because we felt that um, the girls, especially, they have been exposed uh, security issues uh, which was rampant in Nigeria, where people go into, kidnappers go into uh, schools and take kids out. Now, this doesn't affect the rich because their schools are, are fenced. So, and I want to say something now that uh, for everyone to know, there is no person who is rich enough to afford a bike that will ever allow his children to go to public primary school in Nigeria. And if there's any data to, so to, to be, uh, I mean, if, if somebody believe that what I'm saying is not true, I, I want somebody to come up to me to say, to tell me 
that we have people that are average or people on salary who have their children in public primary school in Nigeria. I know I have tried, I've tried to look around. I know it's very, very difficult because no matter how poor you are, they can afford a primary education in a private uh, facility. So if you see any child going to a primary school, go and check the bio data. They are, they are, they are orphans or maybe single parents or no parents at all. And they come and nobody's even care, nobody cares about their story. So that's why we adopted a public primary school in that community. We did, uh, we supply books, we supply them. These guys have never seen laptop for the first, they saw laptop for the first time from us. They've never seen it, they've never touched it. They don't even know how it looks like. Uh, we did some infrastructural uh, repairs because they are marginalized, they are neglected. Um, the facilities are down. Uh, until recently, I had the, the Ondo State government is doing something in the primary school, but the secondary school, there are still issues about uh, facilities. We bought standby generator for them because they couldn't even use the laptops because there's no, uh, that as this have been cut off from uh, uh, national grid for the past 13, I think, is it about 10 to 13 years ago that there's no supply of uh, national uh, power through the national grid been cut off. So we needed to buy generator. So we bought more uniforms. So we went to school and checked the kids and see how they are dressed. So we bought more uniform for about 60 to 100 uh, kids. We bought them shoes, give them bags, uh, books. And of course, they still have to pay school fees. And many of these children are driven home in primary school. Because the law says every, I mean, the, the law guiding uh, primary education in Nigeria says that from primary one to GSS three, you should have free education. But it's not true. It's not, it's not happening presently in Nigeria. So some of them are driven home. Can you imagine a five-year-old, seven-year-old child being asked to go home from public schools because they could not afford school fees? So those kids will be called and uh, will pay their school fees so that they can be in school. Um, at a stage, which we had that um, some of them were coming to school with empty tummy. That was in 2016, 2017, 2018. Uh, they were coming to school without food. So we started giving them uh, free lunch. I mean, good meal, eggs. Now, I mean, we call Monday egg day. You can see the number of uh, kids rushing to school when they know that there will be egg. They come to school very, so things change. The punctuality changed. The attendance changed because of food, because food matters to a child. Yeah. So we're giving them quality food until recently, about a year ago, the government started giving food for primary one to primary three. But we still continue with primary four to primary six until this lockdown happened. So, and for the people in primary school and secondary school, some of these guests are not coming to school because during their menstrual period, they don't have all the equipment to stay in school. So they miss school time. So what we did was that we did a seminar on personal hygiene and we started giving them free sanitary uh, parts uh, for guests. Uh, it's important that guests, it, 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 it's, it's saddening that it, it's something that is breaking my heart that we couldn't, we are not, we're struggling to give girls education because mm -hmm. they will, uh, what happens to them at the end of the day is that when they are frustrated out of school, they will get somebody to, to give them pregnancy, they will get married to someone else that they don't want to, just for survival. So a child who cannot afford sanitary power, what do you think he, he, she will be able to afford? So I think we need to do more in that area and that's what we're trying to reach out to them. And uh, they are, they are, uh, we also discover their parents are struggling too, especially widows and single women. So we started giving them money. Uh, we give them interest-free loan uh, to start trading so that they can feed their children. Um, I don't know what, basically we don't really usually get the money back, but we have put another structure in place so that we can have a cooperative setup in which they can have this money. The money will be belong to them. So they will take responsibility for it, for uh, giving it out and recovering it. It won't be our responsibility. That's the next level we are going into now. But we, went, we need to empower the women so that they can take care of their children and so that their children can be in school. Um, um, our immediate plan now is to reduce uh, the, the level of literacy and numeracy among school going children in rural communities in Nigeria is appalling. It's, it's, it's really bad that a child of 15 years old still in primary four, primary five, and they, 
they, they, they, they're struggling to read. Now, I'm not talking about numeracy because you need literacy to be able to uh, do numeracy. And of course, they don't have any of these. So we are uh, starting a program as soon as this lockdown is all uh, to give them private, um, uh, we're starting a mobile library where we take books to their homes and uh, help them, support them to read. So that's one part. Um, the other part is to set up a, le a lesson, a coaching class for children, go to schools and look at children uh, who are struggling with reading. Because if you cannot read, you can't do general, uh, general studies. If you cannot read, you can't do BK. If you cannot read, you can't do Yoruba. So you are like useless in school. And some of these kids, when they stay in school for a long time like that, and they can't still read, uh, self-esteem starts going down and they will lose interest in school because they can't, they're not communicating. They can't communicate with anyone. So we're trying to, and it's the, the number, uh, uh, when I did my survey, it's not, we're talking about children in SS1, SS2, the senior secondary schools, who are even preparing to do uh, the external exam, could not read, could not read. So I was wondering how they got to that stage. But I think a lot of things happen in the process. But we need to change this uh, uh, this by affording them the opportunity to improve on their uh, literacy and numeracy so that they'll be useful, so that they can read instructions, so that they can support their children. Girls are important. I know boys are important too. Boys have a level of, they can still resist, they can still struggle like I did, but I don't know how many girls in my own set in uh, 1991. The numbers compared to boys ratio is very, very low because they, they're easily, somebody can always ask them to get married or do something and they get uh, uh, early pregnancy and they're out of school for life. So, but a guy can still do something and come back and struggle and struggle. So that's what we're really focusing on. Guess we'll do for boys, but we're fo focusing on girls. And the last one I want to talk about is about uh, ICT. Um, it's very low, not even, of course, it's not very low. It's it, it's really bad in, in in the area of ICT provisions. There's no internet facility. They don't even have a laptop uh, or a system to use, let alone talking about uh, ICT. So we're trusting God for money to be able to uh, reach out so that we can do like I can start teaching if I have online facilities from here from the UK. I can start teaching the kids. Uh, I could get some of my friends to start teaching like you, Prof. The an area of studies that you love, you can start maybe one hour a week to teach a child. Now, if, if yeah. we, a child in secondary school in that rural community could see a professor in South Africa teaching him weather biology or something, now you can imagine the kind of perspective, the kind of mindset they start building towards yeah. success in life. You, uh, it's, it's unimaginable. And that's the kind of thing we're looking for. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. It's amazing. But you know, you started small, and it became big. You know, a lot of people would think there's nothing I can do. There's something you can do. You can make a difference. Yeah. And that difference can become big, you know, and people came in, they, 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 they came on board, they supported the project and it's becoming big and big. Mm -hmm. And I see it becoming bigger because mm -hmm. um, not only limited to Kitsupa, to all the states mm -hmm. of the Federation, yeah, well, um, um, the last we've started with uh, in Lagos, we started yeah. uh, also in uh, Delta. That's great. So we're reaching out to women, especially widows. So we're like yeah. empowering them, give them money to start their business, and um, maybe all over, like you like to say, we'll go all over the country. That's because great. We're registered That's in Nigeria great. with the federal government. Okay. We are allowed to operate anywhere in the country. Okay, that's great. Is 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 a is a great initiative, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm hoping that. Um, some of my listeners to we take up the challenge and start non-government organizations because there's a lot of work to be done in Africa, yeah. especially in Nigeria. Okay. Recently, I read that Nigeria is the the world uh, poverty, you know, capital of the yeah. world. That's yeah, true. you know, and and, and if you're from and and it's it's shameful because we have a lot of billionaires all over the world yeah. that are from Nigeria. So we should not be in that position. So there's something all of us can do to make a difference. Yeah, and we true. can start small and think big and add big. Yeah. Uh, it's awesome. 
I've, I've really learned from you. I'm, I'm, I'm so, uh, you know, interested in what you're doing and I'm also going to be supporting. I also have an organization called Operation Transform. We, we empower small farmers. Uh, we empower young people, but mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm going to, uh, next year, I'm going to be supporting your organization too. You, uh, you know, I'm going to be supporting your organization yeah. too, so that we can make a difference together yeah. in, in Africa. And if we don't do it, it's going to do it. No, you know, no, not, we no. can, you know, they're going to, you know, and, but I'm also happy that people in your church are also supporting, but I'm, uh, I'm sure yeah, they saw your passion. <laughs> they, saw, eh? they, they saw your passion. Yeah. They saw your passion. I'm sure they saw your passion. Yeah. And they trusted you. Yeah. They they trusted you. You know, they must have seen that this one is a different person. They trusted you that you know you are passionate about your country. Yeah, I, th I think my, my church sees uh, the social and the justification. We're trying to combine it together. It's, it's together. My church has projects in Uganda, and mm, these us are British, so they yeah. don't really have any link with Africa. They don't have it, they don't hold uh, Africa in anything, but they're uh, yeah. passionate. Uh, anytime I bring issues up to them, I've, we've done surgery for, for 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 kids. I just bring it up. I just mm. we've got to do it. I mean, sometimes my pastors will have start crying by the time I tell my tell my stories. He, mm. She's passionate about it. She's always asking me what what else do we need to do? We don't have a lot of money. Now these are contribution from members. Uh, yeah, like I mean, any other person like twenty pounds, ten pounds. Mm -hmm. We're not very rich in terms of, mm -hmm. but the little we have, we're using it to support people because they deserve it because yeah. God, we're trying to show God's love to them. Uh, yeah. Practical approach to their needs. And I think that's really gospel because there was a particular time Paul collected offering and he took the offering mm -hmm. to Jerusalem for the poor Christians. Exactly. So it's all about, Paul, Paul was even saying that I was, when they were telling him to consider the poor, Paul said, this was what I wanted to do. I've mm -hmm. always wanted to consider the poor. Mm -hmm. So, Christianity is about reaching out to the poor. We can never, never deny that. Yeah. Because Jesus said, the poor you will always have in your midst. Yeah. And we have a responsibility. Oh, you, can, you remember the, this scripture? I was shocked when I saw it in the real mm. sense of it. Mm. He said, when I was uh, sick, you visited mm. me. That's I scripture. can't imagine somebody being, their destiny being determined because of what they give. I was, I, I can't, the Christ, hey. why would you consider this? I, <laughs> Why? And he told them to go afraid. to the left hand side. The people who never did it. They asked him that Jesus Christ, we never saw you. He said, if you can do it to the least of these ones, you have done it to me. So I was poor, I was naked, you gave me clothes. Oh my days. That's to see, that's to tell us the emphasis Christ put on the poor. He said, He that giveth to the poor, lend it unto God. To God, to God. You see, when I saw that scripture, I was like saying, Jesus. Is it about is it about works? Ah, I'm telling you. Is it about, Jesus, what are you saying? Is it about works? <laughs> but but let's now realize is this. If you say you have faith, yeah, and you don't have you, you don't you're not showing it by your works, maybe <laughs> it's not real. Yeah, it's you can it's not real. doubt the person's faith. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, you can we cannot categorically say that the person is not saved, but we should start yeah. doubting it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Jesus emphasized that, yeah. especially when I when I read that scripture, I also I still read a few few weeks ago. I was like, say Jesus, Jesus. I, I, really he created a, a major um, post. That, I mean, that was the only post that I, that was written about him. That yeah, he created yeah. a post to be managed by Judas. Yeah, <laughs> for the poor. Yes. Hmm. May God, may God help us. May God help us to really. To really be like Jesus, indeed, that really had passion yeah. for the poor. He was always thinking about the poor. Mm -hmm. He even decided to come as a poor person. He was not poor. The Bible I'm says he became you. poor. He, decided, he chose. He didn't. He, he didn't choose a rich family. He could have chosen uh -huh. a rich family, but he yeah, wanted to exactly. identify with the poor. That, he said, that, "Not that many mighty you, were the, called." The heart of God. The heart beat yeah. of God. He said, not many mighty were called, not many noble, but he has chosen the foolish thing, the poor, mm -hmm. to conform the wise, mm -hmm. you know. And I just pray that God will help us mm -hmm. to really consider the poor in our midst, you know. Uh, you know, uh, And I'm excited about uh, your initiative, Extra Community Helper Initiative. And I know that God is going to bless it. It's going to go from glory to glory. But keep on thinking big. Uh, you know, it's not only 
it's, it's going to go big because we need that kind of initiatives in Africa and people to manage it in Africa. Uh, especially look at what is happening in the North. We need people to say things there because we also have Christians in the North and we are really suffering in the Northern part of our country. Uh, bro, maybe I could, maybe just keep in this. The issue, are you, so, are you not shocked that a lot of people that are helping the people in the North are from overseas? Yes. The I Samaritan Post. The, yes, message, the Samaritan Post. The Prison yeah. Fellowship International. The International yeah. Justice Mission. The World Mission International. Hmm. They are the one doing all this. What are we doing? We can't say we're poor, that we can't help ourselves. Why do you think this country continues to improve, to get better? When it, you can't break the law of God. They are giving to the poor, so they're always led into God. God needs yeah. God. I mean, that's what, that's what they're yeah. doing. That's what they're doing. That's what they are doing. And the that's people that are giving to this Samaritan post, they, they are not many of some of them are, are cleaners here. They are not like mm. professionals, big boys. They just little little that they have. They are they giving to the poor because it's the passion they love, and, mm. and that's the gospel they had, the gospel of giving. And they, they continue to yeah. do that. Yeah, Doc, you are full of wisdom. Mm. May God continue to help you. Amen. Yeah, Amen. yeah. Uh, okay, what's your closing remark for us today? Oh, um, Christians, uh, we shouldn't give up on ourselves, uh, no matter what is happening around us. Uh, I want to quote from Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. So, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Perfect. Uh, I, can't, I can't explain that scripture more than, I think it's uh, self-explanatory, that we should continue to do good. Preach the gospel continue, and also continue to do good. Let's have a complete gospel. The gospel of justification and gospel of justice. If you need to speak against racism, speak against it. Don't assume that somebody else will do. If you need to speak against um, the, the way immigrants are uh, badly treated, you need to speak against it. We need to stand for justice because the gospel, the, the, the church is the pillar and foundation of truth. Christ is the truth and Christ stood for the poor. He stood for the widows. He spoke on their behalf. He spoke for the weak. Uh, uh, for the immigrants, the Bible said that we should we should not we should allow strangers, even to the extent that some people will entertain angel. I mean, uh, angels in the process. We need to do that. We need to have complete gospel of justification and justice in our uh, in, in 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 Africa, especially. We need to get back to that. That no Thank no you, one should go among us. Nobody yeah. should go back after church on Sunday with empty tummy. No. We should start looking at, we should start talking. If they are not speaking, we start, ask people, do you have food to eat today? As you're going back home, ask family, what's happening in your home? Do you have food? Not just giving them spiritual food. Let's give them physical food. Thank you so much, Professor. Yeah. What you said just reminded me the first time I visited the United States of America in 2009, mm -hmm. and I attended a church. My sisters live in the U.S. And I attended their church. They go to the Palais in the U.S., mm -hmm. And when I go to their church, I was surprised to find grocery, a lot of food, name it, fruits, uh, yogurt, mm -hmm. bread. And they were taking things home. Mm -hmm. I later found out that companies in the U.S. brought those food mm -hmm. for them to give people in the church and those in the community. I was surprised. I was like saying, how can I trans transport this food to Africa? <laughs> you know, Do you know that in my I, church, in my church, we have uh, a big uh, container where yeah. every every Sunday you bring in food mm. and you put it there to take care of the, the needy. So we always mm. have, book, uh, we call it food bank in the church. Food bank. We need it. We need it in Africa. We need all our churches. Food bank. Yes. You know, and we can encourage our people to do that. Yes. You know. You can encourage our people to do that, to bring food. People that have surplus, yes, you can exactly. bring it to the church. People can take it when they are going home. 
we can do that. I know some churches have started it, but we need it. We need to it, make more impact. Yeah. We need to make okay. Yeah, yeah. It should. It should. It should be common. Yeah, it should uh, be exactly. It should not. It, it shouldn't be, be one off thing. It's not. Yeah, it should be common. Christmas period, yeah. just Easter period. Mm. Giving to the common. poor should be something we yeah. should do. It's a priority. Even yeah, before should, buying, building a, 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 yeah. a place of worship, giving yeah. to the poor should come before them. Mm. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Thanks so much, Doc, for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this interview with me. I Thank am you extremely for the opportunity grateful. Too. Yeah, that you could make this interview. I've really learned a lot. And to our viewer, let me first wish you a Merry Christmas. Uh, a Merry Christmas, Merry thank Christmas God that we're remembering. Yeah. Merry well, Christmas, yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, we're remembering remembering the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I mean, I mean, to me, I always say there are two most important dates days in history. Number one, when Jesus Christ was born, and number two, when Jesus Christ resurrected. Mm -hmm. And today, we are remembering when he was born. What an awesome day that. Day was because that day Jesus came and our story changed because we gave our life to him, become his children, become sons of God. It's, it's amazing. I just want to encourage you to go to the mountain, to go over the hills, to go everywhere and tell people that Jesus is born, to remind them that Jesus has been born and that he's the savior of the world, is the Lord, and to tell them to give their lives to Christ. And not only that, for us to reach out to the less privileged, to give during this season, and not only this season alone, to always be givers, to help those that are less privileged, to help the vulnerable group in our midst. And like what Doc said, we must be on the side of social justice. We must support the weak. We must support those that are going through a time. We must, we must speak out. We must not be silent. We must be bold. We must be courage, courageous like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I hope you've learned one or two things today. I want to wish you a wonderful day ahead. See you next time. Bye.